Look, we're back and uh, you need to grab a copy of, of the Business Daily if you want to get all the words about the bank and the shareholders earning, uh, of course, top dividends there. Lenders battle 133 billion shillings de default. First of all, this is from the non-performing loans as well. Total dividends for nine tier one banks uh, flat. That is uh, the current state of play, as you can see there. And we have some of the faces of these leading banks uh, which have been splashed on the front page of the Business Daily this morning. And it says that Tier 1 banks' cumulative dividends remained flat in the year ended December 2023 as lenders made huge provisions to shield themselves from 133 billion shillings default. The large banks have proposed to pay their shareholders 63.0306 billion shillings for the period effectively unchanged from 63.07 billion shillings they distributed in the year ended December 2022 and you have the top top banks dividend payout there given or broken down for you oops I wanted there you go top banks dividend payout this is uh, leading their equity 15 at 15.1 in 2022 in 2023 that has remained largely the same um, we have Stanshot which has ticked up to beat at 11 uh, percent there, 11 billion shillings, I should say. We have Cooperative Bank remained flat. Absa, uh, it's also ticked up to 8.4. We have NCBA uh, just by a percentile there of 0.8. Stanbic, we have 6.1. And going down to KCB, uh, there was no dividends uh, this year uh, or that 2022-2023 financial year. And of course, the total is given there. Uh, have a little luck. You might want to speak to this particular graph here or the, the list here on this dividend payouts, if you may. And uh, largely, what really is informing the current state of play uh, with the flat lining, so to speak, of the dividend share? I think, I think um, we need to put this into context. Yes. One is the fact that I'm. Um, uh, you know, in an environment like today where there is doom and gloom everywhere, I think this is uh, good news. It's good news. You know, if you look at the performance of the banking sector as a barometer of uh, the economic um, performance and as a leading indicator of, uh, you know, how the economic, economy is picking up, I think this is a good, good sign mm. that you are going in the right direction. But I think having said that, there is also an issue of perception here. You see, banks are regulated under very strict regime, and all of them are meant to report their financial numbers by the 31st of March in public, you know, in, 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 you know, disclosed in the public newspapers. So no wonder right now all banks are almost falling over each other to ensure they report their numbers. And you saw the headline there; it was all the, you know, the CEOs, you know, they are having reported um, some, you know, good numbers. So it's also an issue of the fact that um, they all have to report by now. I was looking at the paper today in the, st the standard today, mm. I think I saw banks, 10 of them, having reported their numbers in today's paper. Yes. So mm. it, it then creates that impression of the fact that, um, and because banks are heavily capitalized, their profitability will also be in large numbers. It gives that impression of the fact that it's only banks that are doing well. But it's a perception issue because of their reporting, reporting regime. But having come to that... Back but to is it really a, a perception issue? Because also when we had the COVID-19, it seems the banks were the people who are doing well. But if you yeah. imagine that yeah. um, there is an institution you know, in, the, in the market that could, could possibly be reporting a, a higher profitability than the combined profitability of all these guys who are there, you'll be surprised and we don't know about it, we don't talk about it. But when banks report, because they are reporting together, we now see it and we actually talk about it because they are all reporting at the same time. But the other players in the market who are making more profits than these guys, and we don't talk about but it, but let's not go there. No. I think <laughs> the point... <laughs> you don't want to go there. <laughs> I can see. I, I think the point you raised here about yes. the growth in dividends, you know, right now I think we are reporting higher numbers in terms of dividend compared to last year. And I think one of the things is to know the fact that we are talking about 2023 compared to 2022. Mm -hmm. 2022, we had very depressed performance because we are coming out of, uh, one, it was COVID, and then two, there was the depressed performance because of the 
election, electioneering process. So performance was de generally depressed. And if you look at the way they are reporting numbers, even now, by the profitability, if you check almost all of them, they are talking about the growth in profits. So you're talking about 2022 compared to 2023. Mm -hmm. Not actually about the absolute numbers. You're talking about the growth. So you'll mm -hmm. talk about 50, 120% growth from the previous year to current year. Mm -hmm. Again, the perception. And these guys are communicating to the investors. They want to pro report the best possible position to the investors to show that they are doing well, which is, which is acceptable. But the actual reality is the fact that um, besides that apparent growth in the dividends, which is co from a depressed position to the current position where we are seeing some pickup and recovery in terms of their performance, I think there is a number that very few of us are focusing on, and that is the provisions for uh, loan loss. And I was looking at the numbers in the papers, the 10 banks that have reported. And if you look at their loan loss provision numbers, there is a significant growth in that number. And that is showing the fact that these guys are sitting on, uh, let me not call it a time bomb because mm -hmm. that, will be, that will be a little bit, uh, you know, alarmist. Um, uh, alarmist. But I think we are sitting in a position whereby we are building up an unperforming portfolio in our books. And we need to create enough capital for us to be able to withstand that in the future when they actually come to defaulting. So let's not sit pretty looking at that growth and think that everything is well. We have got a struggling economy that is beginning to pick up. And because the credit growth mm -hmm. is picking up, mm -hmm. we are also beginning to see that manifesting itself in terms of the non-performing portfolio in the banking sector. And so the portfolio is not as healthy as we may think. If you look at the numbers that were given by Central Bank, we have been seeing a uh, consistent growth yes. in terms of an performing portfolio uh, within the banking sector. Mm -hmm. And the latest is actually at 15%. That is possibly the highest you have seen over a period of, I don't know, um, possibly 10 years mm -hmm. or so, you see. And that's not a very good indicator. So let's look at these numbers in context. Mm -hmm. That it's a good indicator, yes, we are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But we are also building up some uh, significant um, uh, underbelly within our system to the point whereby if we are not careful, it will explode, mm -hmm. you know, going forward. Mm -hmm. And we just need to ensure that we are building up enough reserves in our books to ensure that um, uh, in the event that it finally crystallizes, we have got enough capital to actually withstand that shock. So we're talking about the non-performing loans uh, that is rising to, to an amount of almost 600 billion shillings just from the manufacturing sector that are not yeah. really, uh, you know, servicing their loans. Mm. And that is in your books as it stands. Mm. We, we have Equity Bank, which has reported a, a small dip in profit, alluding to also non-performing loans. And this is a niggling worry. Isn't this an, an indicative uh, situation of uh, where uh, the country is headed that First of all, in the manufacturing sector, things are not good, mm. right? There is a suppressed, despite the fact that we, we see the dollar really coming down, but uh, also with, uh, with, with assenting into the Financial Act that had many ramifications there, there is qualms, especially in the manufacturing sector regarding, you know, some of uh, the levies that they found a bit to be very, a bit punitive. Mm. How will this now affect, because I think now, it is so, sort of hockey dory that we can see from the banks, but you're saying there is a simmering fire, a powder keg that is waiting to explode. Uh, 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 is it in any way going to affect the trajectory of the economy moving forward? Because now people are saying, oh, our GDP also uh, seems to be now shaking into place. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the whole thing comes from where we are coming from. We are coming from a situation whereby we had a number of challenges. Um, there was COVID, um, there is the, you know, the election, um, uh, electioneering period, which tends to slow down the economy. We see normally every five years, there's a pickup in terms of economic activity, and then a as slump, the, there, the slump election, and yes. then, you know, then it picks up. So we are in that state currently where we are not only recovering from the effects of the COVID, but also from the slowdown in terms of the, the, you know, the political, uh, the electioneering period, and therefore economic activity now beginning to pick up. So as it picks up, I think banks sit in a very vantage position in terms of supporting the productive sectors of the economy to be able to um, access credit to then be able to uh, you know, pick up in terms of the economic activities and therefore growth. And manufacturing, you mentioned, is one of them. Manufacturing was significantly affected not only by uh, the, the, you know, the effects I've mentioned of COVID and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and electioneering, but also there are the geopolitical tensions. 
many of them actually get um, uh, their inputs from the external markets. And with the, you know, the Ukraine and um, currently now the Gaza war and in terms of them being able to get their inputs coming in, that then affects the ability to pick up and pick up in terms of economic activity. Now, therefore, banks come in to support that. And we have seen some pick up in terms of credit growth towards specific sectors. And manufacturing is one of the ones that has really shown some positive um, development in terms, of economic, in terms of credit growth. But in there, they are still facing these challenges you have mentioned. And so even as credit grows, we know that we are building up a possible non-performing portfolio within those specific sectors. And so the probability of that money being recovering back for, for, from the banking point of view is not guaranteed. And therefore, the need for you to start building up uh, provisions. When you build up provisions, it affects your performance. The quality of your balance sheet is affected from a banking sector point of view, and then regulator requires you to make some specific, you know, um, um, provisions in your books and all that. So, to your point, mm -hmm. I think manufacturing as a sector is one sector that banks are very, really keen to support because of the impact it has in terms of the overall economic growth. Mm -hmm. They're targeting now to, I think manufacturing currently in terms of the GDP, they are about seven, seven point something percent. Mm -hmm. The intention is to move it to 10% and hopefully 15, which was the original target. But that is something that cannot be done without the clear support of the supply of credit to the sector. Mm -hmm. So the pressure for us to continue supplying uh, credit to the manufacturing sector is there. However, there are these challenges that you're talking about. And so banking sector will have to watch keenly as the manufacturing sector picks up, but also ensure that you don't lose your shirt as you try to support your brother who is ailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. I like it. But uh, talking about losing the shirt, uh, the bank has not been losing the shirt because uh, what Abel is not telling us that, uh, you know, the government has been also their biggest uh, mm. business partner, so to speak. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because they've been heavily borrowing from, uh, from the banks. And this has been also a niggling worry that uh, everyone has been concerned that the private sector, the manufacturers, the common monainchi, they are denied of this uh, access to this facility because the government is the one who is a heavy borrower of the banks. I don't know what you'll uh, talk. You, you, uh, he's you, not even looked at the Financial Act no, as no. it is and how it has exacerbated the whole situation. No, he, 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 and you see, you see, what is Abel not telling us that uh, no, 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 he's no. told us? Abel is the <laughs> CEO of the bankers, so he's, uh, he, must, he must be careful. He has to be, be, be measured. He has to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, generally, I think the picture he's painted is correct because then banks are cautiously optimistic. Cautious because they also know that with the pain and with the economic crunch, there is likely that a number of people are not able to, uh, to, 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 to pay up their loans and so on. So yes, the provision will have to be there and it's an important provision because then at least you do not carry it in the balance uh, uh, sheet as if uh, you're expecting the money when you know for sure you might not get it and even if you go to auction and other things. Again, recovery isn't always what you expect. But the other thing that you want to say about the banks is that they are one of the heavily regulated uh, entities in the market. Banks are regulated by the central bank. Banks are regulated by the CMA. Banks are also still part of, and I keep saying that these are things we need to think about. They are still, also still part of the companies, Act, so they are still again regulated around there. Uh, that they can still play in this space and be able to make profit is also a sign of resilience. Uh, Kenyans are very optimistic people, so when you want to see how things are, that's, even when we are crying, banks are, are, are smiling. And it's because we are still dealing with banks, we're still going to formal systems, and so we're still putting money there. But the other thing which you have said is that when things are so bad for the government, when borrowing is so high, and the treasury bills and the bonds are going up, banks latch in to make uh, that money. We have not talked about the foreign exchange uh, window that was in there, because when the shilling was uh, on a free fall, Again, it depended with where the banks were putting their money offshore. 
and therefore making it also big time because then whatever you can invest overnight and how you can bring it back and the shilling is uh, uh, behaving the way it was behaving against the dollar, there is always room for profitability. So that is okay. Let's give it to them. What we need now to agree is that there must be also something that's happening in that sector that is reflective. And when you were saying that there could be other people making money, indeed, if you took the banks here and you took the combined uh, performance of the cooperatives alone mm -hmm. in this country, uh, from Cusco, and then you took all the cooperatives, uh, you, 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 you know, the, 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 the UN women and others. So if you put all those circles together, mm -hmm. Uh, it will give you a, yet another story. You know, they are not obligated to report because they are not uh, public entities. I mean, they are not quoted, uh, you know, on the public, uh, you know, on the, on the stock exchange. So they are not obligated. Mm. I mean, the cooperatives. But if we were to get that report, circles, and then you put in the microfinance uh, group, and then put in uh, <laughs> the, 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 the other guys, the, the, you know, there are the other guys somewhere there that we don't want to mention. But <laughs> they are there, you know. This, Which are these guys? You know, this, this, that other... Uh, they are not here. They are not on this table. <laughs> but they are there, there's this other player that, uh, you know, where we like to go to Tala. You know, there's that, that space of uh, borrowing and uh, lending and so on. From the di so digital platform. The digital yeah. platform, yeah. Uh, of course, and we have not talked about even the... The, 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 the Bitcoin and, and so on, so that when you are looking at the entire performance generally on 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 on, on, on uh, money terms, money returns, yeah, the likes of uh, you know unit uh, funds and so on. So we are okay in terms of seeing what is happening. Are the profits anything to be to be worried about? No. Uh, to be happy about, obviously, if you are an investor and you you have uh, put your money in. Some of these stock, you know, the, the, the ones that are quoted and you put your, your shares there, you, you should smile. As to whether you see six point something or 15 billion coming through, you know, of course, those who make that money make it big time because uh, the, the returns to some are huge. To others, like Professor here, uh, because I know I seem to think that I know his pay slip. It's not so much, but. It's there, reasonable, but of course, for those who have put in a lot of uh, monies, uh, the returns is, 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 is good. So basically, what we should say is that there are some positives, even as we look at our gloomy situation, there are some positives. Uh, my biggest cry is Kenya Airways, because I don't know why, because losing, losses are okay, but losing in billions is more painful. But, that's but yeah, welcome to Kenya Airways, um, just uh, how it's coming from that uh, rabbit hole. Let's hear from uh, Professor X and Zaki. Uh, I, I, I want to, first of all, uh, dissuade my colleague from claiming that uh, he knows something about my pay slip. Um, I, was, yeah, I wanted <laughs> you to come out so that um, <laughs> <laughs> he knew you were stepping on a, on a roll now. He, he's and, uh, he's uh, going to react. Was thinking yeah. was modest. Sensitive matters. But, but that, that's, that's one reason why teachers, professors, and so on don't enjoy a lot of public prestige because everybody knows how much we earn. Mm. And uh, there's one guy who told me that the amount of money you earn is probably equivalent to my traveling allowance and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but that, that's, that's for another day. But that one is the dis disclosed ones. Yes, the, I think. The, the, the side hustle. You know, when you come to the side hustle, is this where professors really, I, and, and doctors really thrive here? I'll, I'll probably talk in Swahili. You have to get up. KRI could be dropping. <laughs> but I think to... Dr. Oraka, that slump you said after any time we go to La Pause, there's a slump in the economy. In the last 10, 15 years, it has stabilized. Mm. If you look at the Kenyan economic growth when we go to La Pause, it's not as bad as it used to be. Mm. Maybe it's because of the constitution. On the issue of uh, banks reporting their, their very good returns, I, I noted among the top performers, there was only one lady. So I would probably wa wonder if there, there are more ladies, would there be more profits? Would the dividends be much better if there were more readers at the top banks? So, look, there's no question about it that banking has been Kenya's one bright spot, and I totally agree with you. In fact, I wish all the other sectors of the economy were doing well as our banks. In fact, there are some of the Kenya's multinational corporations we can talk about. They have gone to the neighboring countries. We want them to go to other continents, and that's very good for us. But 
the big the elephant in the room is non performing loans and i don't envy any bank because if you keep if you need to keep on increasing your provision for non performing loans it becomes very expensive to the bank itself it's also expensive to the economy because that provision is not put into use it's money you are putting saying if things happen this is what can happen so there should be concerted efforts to reduce non performing loans and what uh, our colleague doctor does is the effect of the increase in interest rates mm -hmm. because when interest go up then more people are not able to pay their loans and the non performing loans goes up but the bigger picture is the bank is a very good indicator of the pulse of the economy how the economy is performing so when banks perform well we are very happy so what we would expect is the banks should should play their role in stimulating stimulating economic growth but now what i'm getting concerned is a lot of money is being lent to the government so there is a lot of crowding crowding out effect so i wish all that money that the government is being lent to through tbus and boards is being lent to individuals like you and me because i'm one of those who believe that money is more efficient to use in the private sector than public sector so overall the banking sector is doing well but if it had more support from the government so that more money goes to individuals like you and me private sector i think it would be doing much better but i th i think we let, let's be sincere the banking sector has been doing well whether the economy is doing mm. very well doing very badly they do very well as comparing banking with other sectors of the economy i think i'm going to do some background back of the end of analysis and i'll report to you whether you are doing better than other sectors but i think you have been doing well because except the kcb the dividends are not that bad <coughs> and maybe all of you should have discussed whether you have shares in banks before we even hold this discussion <laughs> mm. I think you did the close disclosed last week yeah that uh, you, maybe you just, share, yes just a disclaimer on uh, on KCB um you know KCB is not doing badly yeah I think the drop in the dividends was a very strategic decision they made they either had to go to their shareholders to get more funding to come in to meet their obligations in terms of their investment and uh, their requirements or cut down on the dividends and therefore retain that money and use it for the investment rather than mm, pay it mm, back to the mm, to the shareholder and that's a strategic decision they, they took trying to communicate a message to the shareholder that rather than us coming for more money we would rather not pay you a dividend and use that money for our investment requirements and i think that was the decision they made so it's not that they are doing badly it was a strategic decision it is took. a strategic yes yes and we know right. the major shareholder is anyway yes so that uh, when you're not giving the, you are that that shareholder money you, you're also not asking from that shareholder that you're okay mm -hmm. they're not you're not bothered mm -hmm. but you're also about to offload a stake where you yeah. have put in a lot of money the nbk so that also is another source of income but this viewer. is what i wanted also to ask because uh, just barely a few years you've sunk almost uh, 14 billion shillings in acquiring an acquisition of nbk uh, this is and i know of course you're not holding brief for for kcb but you being in that particular space one would wonder why would then be a turnaround that you're selling off is it that uh, it has been in uh, what a going concern uh, it's not been really as expected given the desired result that now it is being offset mm -hmm. because i i think it's not even barely 10 years since that because you yeah. would expect maybe yeah you can shake it to place five years uh, before things streamline and then you have a turnaround now it is starting to break even and make profits mm. you know that's um a piece of information that broke into the market i think last week and even then it's still very very harsh we don't have the details you don't have the, the details whole, the whole transaction but i think looking at it from after having given that um, that that disclosure of the fact that we don't have the details i think looking at it when you have got an asset that is worth so much and somebody offers you a good deal on that asset mm. why not dispose of it yeah you see and i think that's the decision that kcb is making you've got an asset that uh, that is worth so much and somebody offers you a deal that you can't refuse and you can use that money for something better take the money and use it take so the money and use it, it. <coughs> but but, but like i don't know but, but, the, but the metrics around the uh, nbk kcb which is largely owned by the government what? and we expect that uh, a lot of this parastatus will be banking with nbk in the eventuality of his exit who fills the vacuum <coughs> Actually, the bad is something you're raising yeah. on NBK, which is actually <coughs> very germane, eh? because NBK has quite a lot of NS, NSSF and other parastatal funds. Eh? Indeed. 
Uh, so when you sell that, uh, there is need for us to understand that dynamic. But once you know that some of the major players in the in that labor movement at NSSF are also co-towing a lot with government and they are silent because in normal circumstances that Tuoli would have come up and told us whether that was a good thing or not. But he has not said anything because he knows that a lot of NSSF money is there, workers' money is there. So you can look at it in terms of business, but you can also look at it in terms of strategic, but you can also look at it in terms of a political uh, decision. Because how would you justify the sale of a bank that is largely owned by a government institutions or parastatos uh, in a manner that uh, perhaps the details we don't have, and maybe those are things we should be looking at from a corporate governance perspective, we'll see how much information is out there and what the return really is for the shareholders of NBK. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, another big issue is uh, somebody said that Aturi has been quiet, mm -hmm. but the privatization commission has also been very quiet. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So if you look at the position NBK holds in the country, I would have expected a lot of noise. If you remember what one, one time the government said we are going to privatize a lot of loss-making entities. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of noise from parliament, from mm -hmm. everywhere, from the opposition, that the government is selling off very, very yeah. good yeah. assets. Even when without, the input, dead, without, even when without the input of the legislators. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But, yeah. Even when it's selling dead things like the Sugar Company yes. or Mumiasi, you people are making noise. noise. But this is not... This one, even thing. the yeah. parliamentarians have not talked. Yeah. So which me, left me wondering, why is so much silence? Is there more, that, uh, more than we are being told? Could we, could we also hack back and ask ourselves, you know, there was this hue and cry that uh, the, the, private, uh, the privatization bill was being steamrolled very quickly and this should be the precept of the cabinet that it doesn't have also to seek the, the approval of the, the, the National Assembly. So was there something in the pipeline that is leading up to also this <laughs> that we are not? Maybe if you just join the, the, the two, yeah, well, this was this coming. One, yeah, maybe yeah. this one will. Be, uh, this uh, one is uh, a political. Uh, I know. Let, 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 let me make a comment on yeah. this and maybe allay your fears a little bit. You know, the, the impression I get is that um, uh, there is some and bit uh, of uh, discomfort, mm -hmm. and the feeling is like as if because NBK, as you have said, has got quite a bit of uh, deposits from the parastatals and all that, yeah. Yeah? and the feeling is like as if. When NBK is sold, the, the institution will collapse with these deposits, and therefore we end up losing. But I think that is far from the truth. Look at Access Bank, the one that is acquiring this entity. They have made some strategic investments, not only in Kenya, but in across, across Africa. And they are in various stages of actually acquiring a number of strategic investments in uh, various countries in Africa. You must have seen the report, I think, last week. And in Kenya, they first of all came in and acquired Transnational Bank. And they are continuing with, because Kenya is an attractive market for banking sector players, very, very attractive. And so they are seeing Kenya as a very attractive market. And that's a positive for us, for these guys to be coming in to actually compete in the market. It shows that we are actually um, a, a good market. And so for them to have actually expressed an interest in acquiring an entity like NBK, and paying top dollar for that matter for a KCB to have actually released it, it means that actually it's a, it's a, it's a good deal. And therefore, the parastasis you're talking about are actually moving into possibly a better house than where they have been before. And so I will not be very worried about the fact that, you know, this transaction is moving uh, from a public entity into a you know, private sector, into private hands, and therefore we are worried, no. I think for me, it's a, a signal of the strength in the market, the attractiveness of the Kenya market, and let these players come in. And with the competition, it will actually make us wake up as domestic in, players. In, in, in terms know. of Article 10 of the Constitution, we would like to see more of uh, information, transparency. We actually don't even know the numbers uh, unless you do. So we, 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 we just know that there's a strategic decision but there's something that Professor was saying, which is uh, where we started. You see, the more opaque we are, the more uh, we do not explain to Kenyans, the more we confirm that this whole process could be shrouded with some, you know, 
things that we could worry about. And I'm not saying anything in terms of details because we don't have. But what we were saying earlier is that if corruption is ever going to be dealt with, is because we are being transparent, we are being open, and we are being procedural. That everything we do is open in the market, and nobody can uh, doubt it. So, so, so today, one of the things we will be seeing is the, 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 the labor movement. That will be saying, yes, we are happy. If we were to see him saying we are happy, this is going in the right, that right direction, then we would be having a bit of confidence to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're truly saying we're happy, then we should be happy. If the other regulators are saying, look, we have no problem with competition authority, everybody else, because uh, you're right about Access, Access Bank, and Access Bank is, in terms of, it's asset rich. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in Nigeria and in terms of what its expansion program is. Actually in Africa. In Africa. That could be a good thing, no doubt. Just a bit of more information, transparency and so on will help us. Maybe mm -hmm. if, I, if I can add, eh? I think what, the Hubble, there's no doubt that was a good deal. If you look at it from an economic business point of view, setting NBK to access bank is a good deal. I think what we are asking is the process of doing it. Mm -hmm. For example, was there another, did, was anybody else interested in buying that bank beyond access bank? But we can, be, we can be told 10 guys wanted to buy this bank. This was the highest offer, this was the best offer, this was the least offer. I, that's the information we are looking for. So that as voters, as the public, as the, as the voters in this country, we have access to information to say this was a good deal or not a bad deal. Because this, this, this is not a private entity, it's a public entity. Mm. So all we are asking is, the, the deal is good, but we are asking about the process. Mm. And since the presidential elections were nullified in this country, the process has become very important. How you do something. Mm. And that's all we are asking for. Give us information. Remember there was g 2 g deal? And we're mm. also asking for information. Mm. So yeah. give us the information, then we can decide whether it was a good deal or not. Yeah. And even when you talk about g 2 g deal, they steal the fertilizer g 2 g deal that is also <laughs> in the offing. <laughs> Prof, I think I totally Things agree with you in up. terms of the need for the information to be given out to the public. But I think there's also the issue of the timing. You know, KCB is a listed entity on the stock market. We are all dealing in the shares of KCB. And information of this nature can clearly create, um, you know, information, distortion, yes. you know, distortion. Mm -hmm. And we then deal on the market without that information. And to an extent, then I'll be injured as a participant on the market. So KCB then has got to control that information to the point where by, by the time the information is now released, they also warn you that, by the way, our shares, treat them carefully because this information now is out there in the public. And I'm sure in due course, once all these things have been resolved, they have gotten the regulatory approval and all the other approvals required for them to consummate the transaction, I think then the information will be released. Because I'm sure it's not only um, um, Access Bank that bid for it. There must have been a number, and the most attractive deal was, was, uh, was, 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 was Access Bank. And therefore, they will provide all that information. But I think it's the issue of timing. Because you, time, you release the information what, what too early, you, what is, and you cause havoc in the market. What you said is now raising our curiosity. <laughs> that there must have been a process. That's what we are all asking for. That we are, the pri pri privatization commission uh, went public, said we want to sell this and this is what we got. So the, the, in the absence of that, uh, one can only read and under the table deal here and our public asset is gone. And even if it's gone for the for, for good, and, and is there something professor saying? All, for example, where I'm coming from, from a, a legal perspective, all we want is not to impeach this process. Mm. We make sure this procedural propriety, Make sure that every public or every process that required to be, every box that required to be ticked was ticked and the transaction is quickly clean. In other words, there should be no double messaging from the same entity called government. That on this one you do this, on this one you do the other. Because these are the same players who, when they go to Zoya, they say, we will do this. When they go to another person, we will do that. And the people make noise, we will change. So we just wonder a way in which we can manage that can be predictable and we can use that to make decisions. Right. Mm. Okay. But also, yes, yes. just on that point alone, um, just, to, just to add a point there, the fact that I totally agree in terms of the need for that information to be disclosed and, you know, as per the requirements. But let's also remember that KCB is not government. Yeah, and it's KCB that, that is selling mm. its assets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it has got its own disclosure requirements and being a listed entity on the stock exchange. But, but is it the government uh, the largest shareholder? Yeah. Um, 
you know, they, they are not majority. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not majority, but the largest shareholder. In other words, there is a public, single. Yeah, yeah, the the, single. There's a, a public interest that we will trace all the time. Mm. Yeah. Why, why don't we borrow from uh, the what you, you started with the spirit of Bore Thursday? Yeah, the Monday and, Thursday. Yes, mm. and at the time somebody want to marry, I always hear in the church some wedding bands. <laughs> Is there anybody who has a cause? <laughs> no, no, no. This? In fact, you're given 21 day notice. <laughs> so, yeah. so even even yeah, on the last you, Sunday, you're so, still given 21 yeah, days. You're still so. 21 days for you to make this disclosure. So we want the same disclosure for selling any public asset, <laughs> so that uh, even if there's any objection, yes, he can say yes or no. I think uh -huh. that's a, that should be a very nice, uh, you know, sort of a caveat, or maybe something we put in within the law, uh -huh. some spe specific uh -huh. days of disclosure before this deal is done. No, but it's there. It's there. It's there. If you look okay. at uh, privatization, if you look at any process, including in the constitution, fair administrative action, it's there. We are. So what we're asking is not very new. And uh, I like the example he's giving because the reason why you announce bans of marriage is because a man is about to take on a woman and nobody knows this man and nobody knows this woman <laughs> and, nobody, and people may have some past about these people and what you are saying is that should you have reason why this woman should not marry this woman be because this woman was once married to uh, somebody else that's the time for you to come in other words you are given that window beyond which now the law assumes that there was no opposition there was no alternative uh, view about it and which is a good thing because then after that you deal with it differently but if you marry in secrecy it means that when I come to complain, I will have more ground. That's the way I'm talking. All right. Okay. Let's see. We're talking about dividends as well. Kenya Pipeline Company will pay a special dividend payout of 5 billion shillings to the National Treasury for the physical year ending June 2023. The 5 billion shillings dividend earnings come after the KCP KPC profit uh, increased by 21% to 7.6 billion shillings during the 2022-2023 financial year, up from the previous years, that is 6.3 billion shillings. Balanced in terms of even our criticism, we have to understand that so much has been lost. In fact, in the same vein, the data from the Treasury showed that 83% 83 83.1% of all padding bills come from state owned enterprises so on top of raw returns we also have padding bills that have to be looked at so we are trying to say how do we minimize this and we are happy about KPC for coming up and showing the way we are sure that we'll be classifying them in terms of their performance but encouraging them in the same weight in terms of that performance we wish to congratulate KPC for the very good performance. Um, Waziri, like we've just had a meeting in the boardroom where we looked at scoping KPC to go in places to the regional market, uh, to sweating the assets at an asset value of, or balance sheet value of 167 billion. Uh, return on investment should really be what was discussed uh, in a meeting that was chaired by the president yesterday where we are seeking to ensure that the assets are working for Kenyans. And this is what he was talking about, the president uh, putting on notice debt corporations that continue to incur losses. The president who was addressing parastatal heads and CEOs at a state house in Nairobi, at state house Nairobi, said some of these parastatals will be closed down and further directed a 30% budget cuts for state agencies, as Jeff Kirui reports. As President William Ruto gears for his second budget in office, his eyes are set on state corporations running on taxpayers' money and making losses. We will shut them down. We will get the employees to go and work somewhere else. And we just stop making the losses. At least we will stop making the losses. And I want some of those institutions to volunteer. Because if you don't volunteer, you know, yeah, some of them should start tell us the institution here to Tafadali Fungeni, Tizi to Tafdia Gaza Malingine, Dwende Tufanyi, Alafu Ndio Wakenya Waweza Kupote, Wawache Kupote Zapesazao. We need state corporations that are drained to the exchequer. They bring nothing. They just take away what we need for our roads, what we need for our water, what we need for electricity connection. 
I know some of you would be uncomfortable with that conversation. But that conversation somehow must take place. Among the drastic measures President Ruto's administration is considering taking include budget cuts for parastatals during the 2024-2025 financial year. The move will see some of the institutions lose up to 30% of their locations. So we must cut down on our expenditure. We must rationalize. We must make it much more efficient. We must deal firmly and decisively with pilferage and wastage and theft and the so evident corruption. The directive by President Ruto coming just months after Kenya's finance ministry offered 11 companies up for sale in what the government said is geared towards efforts for fiscal consolidation and spurring economic development. Among the state corporations that find themselves on the chopping board include KICC, New Kenya Cooperative Creameries KCC, Kenya Literature Bureau, National Oil Corporation, Kenya Seed Company Limited, Kenya Pipeline Company, among others. President Ruto reiterated his commitment of having an economic turnaround by implementing the agenda that informed his election to office. And I did not become president so that I fill up the position or earn the salary. No, that's not why I'm president. We must change our country. We must change our country. For some time now, the issue of privatization and sale of some parastatals has been a headache with the government appearing to shift positions on the issue after Kenyans questioned the plan. Jeff Kirui KTN. Right, so one of it uh, that has been a profit uh, all year making losses is Kenya Airways. As you can see it right now, is uh, crawling out of this pit. That is a loss of making pit uh, with, uh, of course, uh, the recent uh, announcement on the profit that they've made since uh, they haven't actually been making profit for the last uh, almost seven years, Kenya Airways. But as we even drawing this conversation to a close, uh, I wanted just to ask, because we've had the, the president has been very categorical that some of his those making parastatals should be closed down or they should volunteer. <laughs> I really find that to be <laughs> him saying that with, the, with his, his tongue family in cheek on that particular matter. But why then, before that, we'd run the story of KPC. It's making good, good profit, but it has been listed for privatization. Why then do we have Kenya literature of Biru as well, which is also... It's a profit-making. It's a profit-making uh, parastatal as it is. These are questions that need to really come to bear, uh, and uh, we should ask, uh, actually, what is the rhyme and reason for privatization of these entities? I, don't, I know you don't work for the government, Habib, but you, your personal opinion. No, you don't work for the government, but we have an opinion about government. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that you uh, draw the parallel between the loss-making entities and KPC as one, and why it's also on the... On the, on the chopping, chopping, chopping board, so to speak. I think the reason being advanced for Kenya Pipeline is just purely the fact that if you look at their asset base and the return they are making on that asset base is not commensurate. And they think, therefore, that somebody else can be able to turn better return on those assets than what they are currently doing. So um, that's, I think, the rationale. And you saw the, the minister at the point when they were giving the... The, the check dividend to government. He alluded to that, the fact that the asset base of Kenya Pipeline Company and the return they're getting on it is not commensurate. Mm -hmm. But turning on to the other example of, uh, of Kenya, is, um, I'm, you know, I'm not quite a, a good tracker of the performance of, of these entities, but it, it struck me that um, uh, Kenya was turned around the bend from a continuous um, you know, chain of loss making. But I think let's be clear here. They are very specific in terms of its operating profits that are stand positive, not the actual profit after tax or profit before tax for that matter. Mm -hmm. They are still in a loss-making um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, regime, so to speak, in terms of the profit before tax. But I think it's an important indicator 
given that they are making, they have turned it into an operating profit for the first time. Mm. Because operating profit means that from its core business, its, uh, op, you know, its operations, they are actually now making a profit. And therefore, they are returning um, a positive return based on the operations. Now, the rest could be the other um, charges onto the operating profit that is turning it into a loss. And those normally require just some restructuring. It could be the fact that you have not, uh, for example, your debt. Mm. You possibly have procured the wrong debt. You can restructure your debt in a way that it becomes more affordable. You can extend the, the, you know, the maturity uh, period for the, for the debt. You can do all sorts of adjustments on that, uh, that bit of it. Or even um, you know, the, the, you know, the asset, how you acquired the assets and all that. So you can look at the specific challenges you're having. As long as you're making an operating profit, it means you're sitting on a good ground. Now you can be able to turn the company into an actual profit after tax position from the loss-making scenario that you have. But if you are making an operating loss, that is a cancer. You need to solve that first mm -hmm. before you can ever return a positive profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's right. why I think Kenya is uh, being viewed from that perspective. The fact that, you know, we are all excited about the fact that just turned on the bend. Mm -hmm. But they are still in a hole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, I hear some... And then we give a closing remarks. I think our, we are now pinched for time. time so I hear something I like about the president saying, let's cut costs, less. Uh, eliminate uh, wastage, pilferage, and so on. That is in respect to parastatos. But I would challenge him to go further and actually cut costs in the main national government. That's where our problem is. From Treasury down to every ministry, cut costs, even up to 50%. Mm -hmm. And you will not even be touching human beings. You are simply looking at operational efficiencies. Unfortunately, we don't talk about operational uh, profits in government, but operational uh, inefficiencies is the main problem with national government. So when you look at our one, our three or four trillion budget, besides that, what else are we spending our money on? That's where you need, we need to cut back on. But even related to that, we have also been told that even that debt that we are paying, we don't seem to know how much it is. It's a, it's a moving it target. So it's a moving target. Mm. So let's get, let's get. He says he was not elected to, to go and earn a salary. He wants to change the country. Yeah. Just say, let's, let's look at this thing afresh. What is this debt? And then let's pay what we deserve to pay. But more importantly, let's cut back. Thank if you. we cut back, there is money in this country that can move us. Indeed, forward. indeed. Professor, I think when, when, when Uhuru Kenyatta became the president, he, he came up with a task force that was trying to reform the parastatals, merge them and uh, sell some of them. For 10 years, he never succeeded. And for a very simple reason, there are political implications. So if you mm -hmm. close down a parastato, you hear somebody saying our people are being finished, our people are losing jobs, and so on. So if the, pre the president can overcome that political resistance and reform the parastatal so that not only do they make profit, but those that are making profit can make more profit, and the public gets value for its money, I think I have no, pro have no problem with it. But again, the issue of selling is always bringing issues. Because I, I think if a, a company is profitable, should we sell it or just fruit it on the stock exchange, an IPO? Mm. So let's also be very clear what we mean by selling. Is, not, is it selling outright? If they do an IPO, how is it supposed to be done? But the elephant in the, roof, in the room in this, uh, in this discussion is very simple. Let's make the economy grow. Let's make the environment very conducive that from the hustlers to the parastatos, the listed companies, they can expand, they can make their money, we create jobs for the youngsters, and this country will grow. Thank you. Habila Laka, you want to give your closing remarks? I think if I can just pick up on uh, what Professor said about the briefly. fact that um, mm -hmm. I think all of us should be focused on ensuring that we grow the economy. And the context of what, has, what you have talked about here in terms of the performance of the banks, I think is a good indicator and it dovetails into that in the sense that um, banks are now reporting some good uh, numbers. And those numbers should be seen in the context of the fact that they're actually an indicator of you know, a good performance ahead. But we should also be conscious of uh, you know, the headwinds and the building up in terms of the non-performing portfolio, mm. which is an indicator of the fact that things are not all that good, mm -hmm. but you can manage. Indeed. Right. Let's hear your closing remarks briefly, a one-liner. We have a beautiful country, and uh, all we need to do is to give it better management, better governance, and, uh, you know, some sense of honesty. Mm -hmm. Right.
Professor. How pissed are two all Kenyans? Whatever they shall be. Indeed. How pissed are two all Kenyans? My but no, but they should be in Nairobi. <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever they will be. <laughs> Naivasha now is, uh, you know, so job locked. Uh, yes, heading there yeah, could be a problem. It. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you are painting a very negative picture about Naivasha, and you know I come from Western, <laughs> and I'm going home for Easter. <laughs> so I don't have any other way of getting go home past. except through yeah, Vasha. Go past. And yes. No, no, you go, go, to, go through Naivasha, don't go Vashering. That's yeah. what okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Vashering. Vashering. What happens in Naivasha <laughs> remains in <laughs> Naivasha. <laughs> we want to distort that particular notion. You seem to be talking from experience. Uh, <laughs> you look about growth over the economy. Hey, let the economy of Vasha grow, please. Let it grow. It's doing very well, guys. Let the flowers and the yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. You actually talked about the elephant on the roof, right? And I said, okay, yes, some par parastatons actually, the elephant on the roof, they are waiting to cave in. You, you, right? you, you now corrected me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you corrected yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I really have enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Habil, it's good to see you, Burke, and uh, we wish you the best. I know also, you shall be giving us an exit uh, interview, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, from KBA, yeah? <laughs> after 10 good years. You really transformed the, the institution. Yeah. And you so, where it's going. Yeah, you should tell us what is the next assignment. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been watching Sokoni here on Morning Prime. News Diaries up next.